Father D'Souza, uh, General D'Souza, ladies and gentlemen, I am here under false pretenses. Uh, I must be the only one here who has never been into to a college. Uh, General D'Souza has told you all about me. I am most appreciative of his kind words. My only regret is that my wife wasn't here to hear them. She would have t treated me with greater respect. Uh, and when I say I am uneducated, I really mean it. Uh, I must be the only member of my family who isn't a graduate. I managed to do my inter-science. I got a third division, Mushkil Se. <laughs> anyway, it's nice being in this hall with all the academics and all the educated people. And uh, I take this opportunity of inaugurating your Silver Jubilee series on leadership. Uh, I don't know what one does how, for inauguration, but may I say that I have inaugurated the thing. <laughs> for a long time, I've been watching the scene in India very carefully. Wherever I go, whenever I pick up a newspaper, I find there are shortages. There's a shortage of fuel, there's a shortage of food, there is a shortage of foreign exchange, there is a shortage of housing, shortage of schools, colleges, everywhere. And everybody talks about these shortages. But the one shortage which is responsible for all these shortages is generally glossed over, which is the shortage of leadership. Father, don't misunderstand me. And gentlemen of the press, please don't misquote me which you are always capable of doing and which you continue doing. <laughs> when I talk of shortage of leadership, I do not mean just political leadership. I mean leadership in every walk of life. Whether it's political, administrative, in educational institutions, in our sports organizations, in our industry, amongst labor, amongst the law and order contingents, there is a shortage of leadership. I do not know whether leaders are born or leaders are made. There is a school of thought which says leaders are born. Father, we have a population of 780 million people and we procreate at the rate of one Australia every year. And yet, there is a shortage of leadership. So if those of you who think that leaders are born and who contribute to that theory, may I suggest you throw away all planned parenthood and really let yourselves go. If leaders are not born, can leaders be made? It is my view that give me a man with reasonable common sense and decency, you can make a leader out of him. What are the attributes of leadership? There are many attributes. The cardinal attribute for leadership is professional knowledge and professional competence. Now you will agree with me that you cannot be born with professional knowledge. Even if you are the child of a minister, the son 
of a member of parliament or the progeny of a field marshal. Professional knowledge has to be acquired the hard way. It is a constant study. Professors, engineers, architects, lawyers, solicitors, doctors, they all study their professions continuously. They all contribute to magazines, to newsprints, to all sorts of things. But we in India, as soon as we reach positions of power, whether it's ministerial, secretarial, armed forces, or anywhere else, we think we are the repository of all knowledge. Professional knowledge has to be acquired the hard way. And without professional knowledge, you can never have professional competence. And if you haven't got professional competence, you cannot be a leader. I wonder, those civilian gentlemen who have been charged with the security of this country, whether they have ever read a book on the military profession. I wonder if they know the difference between a gun or a howitzer. I remember a minister one day coming to me. I'd left being the army chief then and said, and I will talk to you in his own language, Zara batao ye hovitzer kya cheez hoti hai. Then I said, what are you talking about hovitzer? Then I discovered that he, want, he meant a howitzer. And I said, well, why are you asking me? Why don't you ask the army chief and others? He said, kaise pooche unse? Mai minister hu? Tere se ta pooch leta hu. Tu janta hai ke mai beokuf hu. I wonder if they can distinguish a mortar from a motor. Or a gorilla from a gorilla. Although a great many resemble the latter. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, professional knowledge is a sine qua non of leadership. You have to have professional competence if you are expected to lead anything. It doesn't matter whether you are in the army, whether you are in the teaching profession, whether you are in industry, unless you have professional competence and professional knowledge, you cannot be a leader and it has to be acquired the hard way. You've got to study all your life. What takes me to the next attribute? The ability to make up your mind and take a decision. And having taken that decision, accepting full responsibility for it. Those of us who have suffered at the hands of superiors who cannot take a decision know what it's like. An act of omission is much worse than an act of commission. An act of commission can be put right even if the decision is wrong by colleagues, by subordinates, by somebody. But an act of omission cannot be put right. Why does a person not take a decision? Because he lacks confidence. Why does he lack confidence? Because he lacks professional knowledge and competence. Eustace will tell you that when I was the army chief, I'd go around, ask my generals, what are you doing about this? And he said, sir, I've been thinking, I've been considering. And then I produced for myself a manic shoism. And father, will you forgive my language? I used to say, if you must be a bloody fool, be one quickly. Take a decision. 
and then accept full responsibility for it. Do you know how much money is lost in the country because somebody won't take a decision? Costs escalate, papers lie in somebody's place for days, for months, for years. And when they finally take a decision, the cost of a project, the cost of something has gone up tenfold. Who suffers? We, the people of India, suffer. So that's the second requisite for leadership. The ability to make up one's mind, take a decision and then stand by it. Don't pass the buck on to your subordinate. It's your decision. What comes next? Absolute justice and impartiality. Those of us who have dealt with masses of men, and I've dealt with over a million men in my time, know the value of this. Absolute justice and impartiality. No man likes being punished, and yet men will accept punishment if they know that everybody who commits that sort of a crime gets the same sort of punishment. They will take it stoically. They may not like it, they may not like you, but they will respect you. No man likes being superseded, and yet people will accept supersession if they know that it's been done fairly and they've been superseded by somebody who is better than them. But not because he happens to be a minister's son or related to Father de Souza or the field marshal's wife's current boyfriend. <laughs> Men will accept supersession. They may not like it, but they will do it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is very, very important in our country. We have tremendous pressures. We have large families. We have fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, their fathers, mothers, etc. We have pressures from them. We have pressures from members of parliament. We have pressures from all sorts of people. And we lack the courage to withstand that pressure. This is very important for us in India. And that takes me to the next attribute, moral and physical courage. I do not know which is more important, moral courage or physical courage. Were I talking to a lot of soldiers, I would lay emphasis on physical courage. But since I'm only talking to a handful of soldiers and mostly civilians, I will lay emphasis on moral courage. What is moral courage? Moral courage is the ability to distinguish right from wrong. And having distinguished that, you must have the courage to stand up and say your piece, irrespective of what your superior thinks, irrespective of your colleagues, irrespective of your subordinates. You must have the courage to say so. A yes man is a horrible man. He must be shunned. He is a disgrace. He may rise very high. He may become a minister. He may become a field marshal. But he will never, never become a leader. He will be used by his superiors. He will be disliked by his colleagues and his subordinates have no respect for them. Moral courage is essential. Now since you wanted to know 
some examples of moral courage from my past. I will give you a little story. In 1970, when General Yahya Khan put all the pressure on East Pakistan as it was then, and refugees started coming to India, there was a cabinet meeting. I remember the date very well, 28th of April. I was summoned. I had a very strong Prime Minister and Mrs. Gandhi who ranted and raved at me, he said, what are you doing about it? I've got so many refugees. The Chief Minister of Bengal has just sent me a telegram. The Chief Minister of Tripura has done this. The Chief Minister of Assam is writing that there are more Bengalis there than their own population. What are you doing about it? And I said, nothing. It's got nothing to do with me. And she said, I want you to go in and take action. And I said, do you know what that means, Prime Minister? And she said, no. I said, it means war. And she said, I don't mind if there's war. So I said, may I please quote from the Bible, the first book, the first chapter, the first verse. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And you say, let there be war, there be war. Are you ready? I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. It is not the right time to go in. The monsoon will break very shortly. And the whole of East Pakistan will be a swamp. I will not be able to operate. The Air Force will not be able to operate. April is a month when we gather, glean the, har the harvest. And the agriculture minister was Mr. Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed. And I said, I will require every railway wagon, I will require every train, I will require all the road space to move my troops. And you will not be able to move your harvest. And then if there is a famine, don't blame me. And I said, the passes in the Himalayas start opening now, the snow melts. And then if the Chinese give us an ultimatum, I will have to fight on two fronts. And then the external affairs minister, the Khalsa, Sardar Swaran Singh said, do you think China will give ultimatum? <laughs> and I said, you are the foreign minister, you tell me. And then my own minister, Jack Jeevan Ram, who couldn't call me Sam, he used to call me Sham. <laughs> he said, Sham man jao na. I said, you come manne ki baat hai? I'm telling you what the facts are. And I said, if you want me to do this, Prime Minister, I guarantee you 100% defeat. Now, Prime Minister, give me your orders. And there was dead silence. And she turned around and said the cabinet will meet at 4 o'clock. This happened at 10.30 in the morning. So, as the cabinet ministers walked out, I being the junior most man there, was the last to go, she said, Chief, will you stay behind? So I shut the door and I said, Prime Minister, before you speak, do you wish me to send in my resignation on grounds of health, mental or physical. I said, oh, sit down. He said, everything you told me correct? I said, it's my job to fight. It's my job to tell you. If your father in 1962 had me as his commander in chief, the country would not have been disgraced. The army would not have been beaten. But the army chief did not have moral courage of turning around and telling him he wasn't ready. So she said, all right, you know what I want? And I said, yes, I know what you want. And I must be allowed to do it my own way. And she said, all right, you know what I want. So ladies and gentlemen, there's a very thin line between becoming a field marshal and being dismissed.
I just gave you an illustration of moral courage. Of course, I didn't worry very much because my wife had money. If I'd gone, she would have looked up. <laughs> she would have looked after me. Uh, so much for moral courage. Now I come to physical courage. Fear is a natural phenomenon like hunger and sex. Anyone who says he is not frightened is a liar, except perhaps the Gorkha. Everyone is frightened. It is one thing to be frightened and quite another to show fear. It's when your knees are knocking and your teeth are chattering and you are about to make your own geography. <laughs> That's when the real leader comes out. If once you show fear in front of men that you may be commanding, it doesn't matter whether they are soldiers, they are clerks, they are labor, they are students, once you show fear, you should quit. Now again, General de Souza said, I must give some examples from my own life. This was in Burma in 1942. I was commanding a Sikh company, big tough chaps, very fond of them. I had a man called Sohan Singh, big man, stood about six foot four. He had been promoted many times to Lance Nike, to Nike, and every time because he was a Badmash, he was broken. We'd had lots of casualties and we had to make promotions. So we had a promotion conference with the commanding officer, and Son Singh's name came up, and I said, No, no use making him, he'll be broken tomorrow. So he was passed over. The conference finished, names were published. I came back to my Basha, where my company was in the jungle. And I found my senior Subhita, Balwan Singh, terribly worried. And he said, Saab, Son Singh ko kaid kar diya. I said, kyun kya hua? Usne bola ke aaj aap ko saab goli marega. So I said, oh, achcha, peshi hoga. So a stool was put in, a table was put there, and Son Singh was marched up in front of me. Son Singh, was at that time a light machine gunner and light machine gunners carried pistols and his pistol was taken away from him. So he was marched up in front of me, the usual charge was read out and I said, So in Singh kya baat hai? He said, Saab galti ho gaya. So I said, Tumne bola ka tu humko goli marega. So I picked up the pistol, loaded it, walked up to him, handed the pistol to him. I said, there are dil hai maar neka maro. And he said, nahi sahab, galti ho gaya. So I gave him a tight slap. I said, case dismissed. Ja, bharo. I went off to the mess, uh, had my dinner, came back, and everybody in the company was very worried. And the Subhida Saab, Balwan Singh said, Nay Saab, aaj raat aapko, aapko goli marega. <laughs> so I shouted out, Son Singh, kidder hai? Son Singh came along. I said, Son Singh, aaj raat mera basha pat tum sentry hoga. A kal subha, paanch baje, ek magga cha, aur ek magga garam pani dadi banane ke liye. Koi shak? Be shak. Par. And I went in there. He, I was woken up in the morning by Son Singh with a mug of tea and a mug of hot water and he followed me like a lamb throughout the conflict. Now ladies and gentlemen, if you think I wasn't frightened, you are mistaken, I was terrified. <laughs> but if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done that and put Son Singh in the clink or something like that, everybody would have said, Deka, hamara saab darta hai. Just an example of how often during riots and all that, some young sergeant with nothing but a little stick in his hand has walked in and quelled everything by showing courage. 
So physical courage is essential to leadership. You needn't be foolhardy like I was. I was very young. I don't know whether I do it today. But physical courage is essential. That takes me to the other attribute, loyalty. Now does loyalty require very much explanation? We all expect loyalty from our subordinates. Do we give loyalty to them? Loyalty is a two-way thing. We expect loyalty, we have to give loyalty. Do we give loyalty to our colleagues? So remember that for leadership you have, you expect loyalty, you've got to give loyalty. Time is running short. There are other attributes. Remember, leadership is nothing else but management of men and resources. Management of men. Men have problems. Men in numbers can be very nasty. And a leader must be able to deal with them very firmly. When people misbehave, like they are misbehaving in Bombay these days, uh, it's no use saying Jai Hind to them. You've got to deal with them very, very firmly. But you must never forget that men have problems. They have human problems. They have problems of death of debt, of debt, of family problems. They get easily despondent. And therefore, the leader must have a human touch. He must have a sense of humor to get them out of their despondency. He must have the gift of the gab. Unfortunately, our leaders have the gift of the gab, but they have no sense of humor. Further, men and women, generally speaking, like their leader to be a bit of a man, a bit of a lad. Take examples of history, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, you will agree he was a great leader. When he came to Rome, the senators used to lock up their wives. Take Napoleon. He had his Josephine and Marie Antoinette and Georgette and Paulette and any number of things. And you will agree he was a great leader? Take the Duke of Wellington. The night before the Battle of Waterloo, in his chambers there were more women of luscious proportions than staff officers. <laughs> and he was a great leader. Do you know, sir, a thought has just struck me. All these three people that I've talked about had one thing in common. They all had long noses. <laughs> if my time is not up, can I crave your indulgence and talk for another ten minutes? Ladies and gentlemen, no amount of leadership will put things right. There are two other aspects that we Indians must know and we lack badly. One is discipline and the second is character. What is discipline? Discipline is a code of conduct for decent living in society one with the other. Who lays down this code of conduct? Not the Prime Minister, not Parliament. Of course it's laid down in the Army, in the Army Act. But I'm not trying to impose the Army Act on you. This code of conduct has come to us from father to son, from mother to daughter, from times immemorial. It's in the Bible, it's in the Gita, it's in the words of Nanak, in the sayings of Muhammad and Buddha. It's all come down. It's been refined as cultures have changed. 
Again, let me illustrate this by example. Non-punctuality is an act of ill-discipline which is injurious to the state, injurious to its people. Some time ago, sir, I was invited to a university as also my wife, unlike today. Uh, I was called there at a convocation at five o'clock in the evening and having been in the army for 50 years telling the driver go slow go fast arrive there or at five o'clock in the evening I was received by the vice chancellor and his lady the union secretary escorted to the dash. My wife too was asked to sit on the dash and she politely refused saying that she'd much rather sit down as this is the only opportunity she has to look up to me. <laughs> and as usual I was garlanded. Uh, the vice chancellor sang my praises and asked me to talk to these people. There were about 5,000 boys and girls there, plus deans, plus professors, plus lecturers, everybody. And as I got up to get to the desk, to the lectern, the vice chancellor says to me, Soto Voce, Field Marshal, a fortnight ago we had invited a VIP to the same function. He was allowed to stand at the lectern for exactly 15 seconds. I wish you good luck. <laughs> I said to myself, had the Vice Chancellor said this in his letter of invitation, I wonder whether I would have come. Anyway, I got up to the lectern and I addressed the gathering for the amount of time that I was allowed. I was heard in pin drop silence. And at the end of it, I got a thunderous applause. The Vice Chancellor and his lady, the deans, professors, lecturers, the student body, and even my wife stood up and gave me a standing ovation. I was most relieved. Although my wife told me afterwards that I looked pale. <laughs> After the usual vote of thanks, etc., we went out into the gardens where refreshments were given. And I, having an eye for a pretty girl, walked up to a pert little thing wearing lovely jeans, tight fitting, uh, <laughs> and I started a conversation which ran as follows. I said, My dear, why were you so kind to me today, all of you? I not having the looks of Rajesh Khanna or Amitabh Bachchan or a speaker like M.G. Ramachandran when only the other day you were so rude to a VIP and she said, I quote, Oh, Field Marshal, that dreadful man we had invited him at five o'clock. He turned up at six. He brought with him a bevy of security people who pushed us aside and took their places where we should be sitting. He brought with him two of his brats, grandchildren probably. He was too old to have those kids that side. Uh, uh, but you never know. Uh, <laughs> uh, He was received by the Vice Chancellor and Lady. He was the, uh, the Union President, garlanded him, and he demanded garlands for his two brats. The Union President, being very flexible, diverted the garlands for the Vice Chancellor and his Lady to these brats. 
and then the vice chancellor sang his praises saying how fortunate we were that he had come here that he has done so much for the country and all the while this man sat there he had come unwashed unshaven wearing a dhoti exposing four fifths of his leg scratching away scratching away <laughs> and the vice chancellor said that the worthy had been to jail when he said that the girl said i almost shouted he should be there now <laughs> then the vice chancellor asked him to go to the lectern and to talk to us so he picked up the lemonade or limka or whatever the was there which belonged to his female offspring and took a sip which started a howl when that subsided the worthy came to the lectern and said friends and well wishers i have not had time to prepare my speech but my secretary has written something for me and he produced a whole heap of paper he said without any premeditation without any thought we made this short stay very short i unquote sir i thank my lucky stars that 50 years in the army had made me come on time that i'd been brought up to shave in the morning and shave in the evening if there was a function that i had a lounge suit on and although i have very nice legs i didn't expose them that i didn't suffer from itch or eczema to indulge in the scratching of the unmentionable <laughs> now do you see what i mean by ill discipline had the worthy come on time according to the program talk to the people and given them advice can you imagine what a lot of good it would have done instead of that his act of ill discipline produced more ill discipline now this is not a matter to be laughed at and forgotten we people in india are terribly ill disciplined we think because we've got freedom that we can do what we like i do not stop you from criticizing to standing up for your rights i think it's your duty to do it but what i abhor are the acts that we have gone into because we have got freedom why do we have to spit pan all over why do we have to write on doors and things why do we have to keep staircases dirty and filthy why do we have to throw garbage in somebody else's compound these are all acts of ill discipline it is because of these acts of ill discipline that you have corruption you have smuggling you have all sorts of things even animals in tanzania are better disciplined I went there 4 years ago and I saw lions lionesses zebras etc they were all so disciplined if the lion wanted to do his stuff he went behind cover he didn't spit I came back from Tanzania I arrived at Bombay airport I cleared my baggage and as i was walking out there was a big fat slob of a man who squirted damp pan on my trousers and i when i when i gave him a tight kick he was most indignant he didn't think he'd done any wrong why why do we tolerate it so much for discipline so everybody has been extremely well disciplined so far will you give me your indulgence for just another few minutes i said character by character 
I don't mean the sort of thing which the father will preach to you. Of course you must be honest. Of course you must be truthful. Of course you mustn't covet thy neighbor's wife. Uh, not, in, not when father is listening. Uh, <laughs> Of course you must know, all that is part of character. But I mean something bigger. It's knowing yourself, knowing what you really are. Unfortunately, we lack that sort of character. And what little we have is denuded by our fans, by the sycophants around us, by the hangers-on. Again, let me illustrate this by an example. Some years ago, Hollywood produced a picture of the great violinist and composer Paganini. And they got a very handsome actor, tall, good actor, who had some knowledge of the violin to take the part of Paganini. And he was drilled to perfection so that when that little cadenza was played and screened, the critics raved over it, raved at the movement of his fingers and of his bow. And this man's fans, sycophants, hangers-on, went on telling him that he was greater than Menuhin, greater than Heifetz, greater than Chrysler. And the man started believing it. And it took eight months in a psychiatric home to rid him of this delusion. Do you know, sir, after the 1971 conflict, my fans, my hangers-on, the psychophants around me kept telling me, sir, you are the greatest general the century has produced. You are better than Rommel. You are better than Guderian. Auchinleck was nothing. And just as I was beginning to believe it, the Prime Minister created me a field marshal and sent me off to the Nilgris. <laughs> and a hard-headed, no-nonsense wife deprived one more inmate of a psychiatric home. I thank you, sir. gentlemen, I'm at your mercy. You can ask me any question you like, personal, pertinent or impertinent. You, I'm getting deaf so you'll have to come nearer me. You're quite right, sir. I was ready. I was told I was going to be picked up at six o'clock. I was ready, waiting. In fact, the people who organized the function came up to me. I was just came out of my bath and said, General D'Souza says, please do not come before 6.45. So will you hang around till 6.30 and then we'll bring you here. Not my fault. I was there absolutely on time. Please blame General D'Souza. <laughs> and he had a reason that everybody works till six o'clock. Uh, traffic is also there, and therefore he decided it was going to be 6.45. I would like to add that... Uh, we go, got to go into East Pakistan. None. Militarily. You cannot go into anybody's country. But we had nine million refugees. We, in our own country, are starving. We don't have enough clothes, we don't have enough medical attention, we don't have enough food, we don't have enough schooling. But we had nine million people, through no fault of our own. We, the Prime Minister of India, went around the whole world telling everybody that I have nothing against Pakistan. In fact, I want Pakistan to be strong. What crime have we committed that we should have nine million people of somebody else's country in my country? 
You Americans, if two Indians go there, you kick up a row. You, the French, won't accept any, anybody coming in. The British don't. Why are you asking me to keep nine million men? Yahya Khan is your friend, not mine. Please persuade him to take these people back or create conditions to, so that they go back. If you don't, then I shall have no recourse but to ask, I was a general then, General Manik Shaw to create those conditions. Now, we had no intention, no desire to go there. All we wanted was these people to go back. And they would never go back so long as the Pakistan army was doing what it was in East Pakistan. I certainly spoke about it. I understood the problem as a soldier and also as an Indian. Now, you ask me about Sri Lanka. The number of refugees that have come in, very small. In fact, they don't want to go back. They're being pushed back. Uh, if two million camels had come in, perhaps you would have had to take some action. Have I answered that question? Would the young lady stand up? Let me look at her. <laughs> Don't be shy. Oh, thank you, dear. What steps are taken from the moment? The, this is... Uh, leadership has been our profession for thousands of years. For thousands of years. The army has provided the leadership. Uh, from the moment the man joins, he comes into an environment of discipline and somebody who is his leader there, and he learns. We don't have courses for leadership. It is by example. If the general officer commanding in chief comes unshaven, you don't expect the others to, to be shaven, to come on, uh, to shave. But because he is shaven, properly washed, properly clothed, everybody else is. If the general officer or the colonel takes bribes, then you don't expect his people not to take bribes. But he doesn't take bribes. Now you ask me, why doesn't he take bribes? Everybody else in India does. And the answer is very simple. It's environment and also fear. If I gave an order and one man disobeyed it, he could be tried by court-martial and given two years imprisonment. If two men disobeyed my orders, it is considered as mutiny. He is tried by general court-martial and given 14 years imprisonment. But in civil life, who cares? The policeman takes a bribe. The inspector takes a bribe, somebody disobeys orders, what happens? You suspend him, he gets a writ petition uh, by paying 25 rupees to any wakil. His case drags on, eventually he's reinstated, probably gets promotion. But in the case of the army, there's an environment from the moment he joins plus fear. There is great fear. We Indians are alleged or supposed to be very religious people. If you read your own religious, religious book, whether it be the Bible or the Gita or the Granth Sahib or the Quran, you automatically have discipline, self-discipline. From your childhood, if your parents are doing their duty, you get discipline into you. If you have any pride in yourself, you have discipline in you. So, talking of self-discipline, there it is. The Roman Catholic Church has done a great deal, has done a great deal for bringing discipline into the world. 
It has erred at times, but it has done a great deal for bringing self-discipline. One of the things is the confession that has brought a great deal of self-discipline in people. You can confess to yourself when you go to bed at night, when you say your prayers, confess to yourself what, what wrong you have done. Otherwise, I can't give you any answer for self-discipline. Yes, sir. Uh, yes.